If you have your Bibles, take them out with me. Open them up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be there and also the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. As you're turning there, I just want to say a special thank you uh, to uh, Pastor Craig for filling in last week. I heard he did a phenomenal job, and so I just appreciate your faithfulness uh, unto the Lord. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal man of God, uh, a great friend to me, and uh, it, it just... Uh, there, there's there's good confidence um, in, in in surrendering the, the 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 pulpit to you, just knowing that you'll honor God and do a phenomenal job. And so I just I say thank you for your your service uh, unto the Lord. Today I want to jump back in into our, our our series on the Beatitudes. We're now into part four. I've entitled this morning's message "Rest." Until your souls rest, until your souls. Let me let me just read a little bit more, just as a quick highlight. Picking up in verse five, it says, "Now this is referring to Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted." And here's where we are today, verse five: "Blessed are the meek." for they will inherit the earth. Let me remind you one more time. I I don't believe that these are seven or eight different people groups. I don't believe that's at all what Jesus is trying to, uh, to teach us here with the Beatitudes. I believe simply what Jesus is teaching us is these are, are, are seven to eight characteristics that should be in the life, represented in the life of every believer. It, it's not that I'm I, I'm just poor in spirit. It's not that I'm I, I'm just uh, could we say one of those who mourn. It's not one of those. I, I'm not just one of those who meek. What what Jesus is really saying is every single one of these characteristics should be represented in our life. It doesn't mean that I'm going to mourn every day of my life, but it will mean that I, as, as a characteristic of my life, I will, I will mourn it. It also represents that one of those characteristics of my life as a believer is I will be poor in spirit. And today, that I shall be meek. Because verse 5 says, once again, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Skip over uh, to Matthew chapter 11. I, I just believe that this is a phenomenal understanding of what it is uh, to be meek. Pick up with me in verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one, no one, no one, excuse me, knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. He says in verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. In my burning is light. Father, we say thank you today, Lord, for this, this moment that we have together. Lord, to honor you, God, just your, your goodness being accomplished in the life of your people. God, and I trust that we, we receive your revelation, your truth into our lives this morning. God, that it grow within us, God, and that it accomplishes that which you've purposed for it to accomplish. God, and that we respond well to your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Before I go too much further, there's one more special guest that I should have recognized earlier that's here with us today. Uh, a former staff member here at our church, now appointed missionaries of the Assemblies of God. Uh, one of the missionary families that we support on a regular basis. They're home just for um, a couple weeks, and I think they leave this week. Is that correct? Uh, to go back to Madagascar where they do ministry. Can we just honor the Vorsters, Rainier and Kristen, who are here with us this morning? It's always a delight to see them. She's like a, one of my daughters, became like one of my daughters in the years that she was here uh, at our church, and it's always a blessing to, to see them. Amen. So as I get into this thought this morning, I realize as Americans, 
our heritage has hardly prepared us for this specific beatitude. I believe our heritage is one that encourages contempt for what we understand to be meek and admiration of the self-assertive. On the one hand, we have inherited through the classics the Roman ideal of greatness in which meekness has no place. On the other hand, I realize that many of us are heirs of the Anglo-Saxon self-assertiveness and insistence on personal rights. Under these mutual influences, we have come to admire power. We've come to admire domination, and could I say it this way, personal success. But Matthew 5.5 5 gives us something different. Once again, it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. On hearing this, Reading this, I, I, I believe the average American will say, to tell you the truth, I just don't admire that. Doesn't that mean a weak and a, a spineless creature, one who's flabby in character and lacking in self-respect? Laboring under this false impression of what meekness is, they often will ask a question like this or similar to this, Who wants to really be meek? More than that, the statement, they shall inherit the earth, they'll go on to say, is ridiculous. Maybe some of them will go to heaven someday, but to inherit the earth? Really, will the meek inherit the earth? I'd probably conclude, I don't believe it. There's no way that that can be true. This beatitude meets often with a, Poor is often met with a poor reception by most people. Perhaps none in this list of the Beatitudes is more unpopular in our society than this Beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To the popular mind, this beatitude is really undesirable. We might would say that it's unbelievable, but I want to remind you, popularity is no reliable test of anything, and certainly not of the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. The popular conception of Christian meekness is both erroneous, and I'll go on to say is probably inadequate. And these ideas are therefore false. This is not, as I said, a popular beatitude because in the world's failure to understand what true meekness is, it neither admires it nor does this world desire the reality of meekness. But there are some things, excuse me, there are some other more reliable tests to the saying that Jesus gives us here in Matthew 5, 5, once again, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I want to give you three thoughts real quick this morning. Number one, the test of God's word. The test of God's word. The word meek and injunctions to be meek are literally sprinkled all throughout the Bible. Our attention is called to the profitableness of, of living a life that is defined as being meek. Moreover, meekness is enjoyed as one of the most commendable traits of a saint, according to God's word. The psalmist said it said it will meet the test of survival in Psalms 37, verse 11. Here it is. He says, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of, of peace. One more time. He says, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Jesus took these words, these words from the psalmist, and I believe expanded them into the attitude 
of every Christian, every believer of Jesus. Paul urged the virtue of meekness on those to whom he wrote in the great passage of Galatians. In in Galatians chapter 5, Paul described this fruit which the Spirit will plant in our hearts. The fruit of the Spirit, he identifies, is meekness. To the Colossians, Paul exhorted how as God's elect, they were to clothe themselves. And in Colossians 3.12, he says, put on therefore as God's elect, holy and beloved, a heart of meekness. To Timothy, Paul's, Paul's own son in the faith, he wrote in 1 Timothy 6.11, but you men of God, follow after meekness. Over and over, Paul, to, to, his, to his, his listeners, encouraged them to receive a heart, of ma- a heart of meekness, to live with an attitude of meekness. The apostle Peter also urged the virtue of meekness. In his first epistle, he said to his female readers in the third chapter, your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Peter knew the mind of the world in these things, so he added this, which is of great worth in God's sight. We can continue a little bit further. The Bible in general demonstrates that that people most conspicuous for meekness are God's greatest people. In the Old Testament, the outstanding example of meekness is not some person of colorless character without spirit, passion, or vitality, but Moses, one of the greatest men that has ever walked the face of this earth. Numbers 12 says, now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. And what a man he was. When we look into the life of Moses, he was courageous. We would say he was resourceful, able, high-spirited. We would probably say that, that Moses was strong, but Scripture identifies he was the most meek of all the men to walk the face of the earth at that time. Why? I would say he was broken to God's bridle. For simply put, I I believe that's what meekness really means. Broken to God's bridle. Amendable to correction. One who's teachable in God's hands. One who's submissive to God's yoke. We would identify he was enduring, forbearing, suffering, not not because he was a coward or not because he lived in fear, but for God's sake, for what God had called him to do, for the sake of the people that he was leading, he was described as the most meek to walk the face of the earth. You jump into the New Testament and his list of 12, referring to the 12 disciples, Mark, Mark said of two of them, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, they were recognized as sons of thunder. But remember with me that this was the same John that became the beloved, probably the most meek of all the disciples. I'll conclude it with this. Above all, Jesus himself is the world's supreme example of what meekness really is. He demonstrated his own beatitude to be very true within his life. So as we go through this, the first thing we discover, number one, once again, is the test of God's word. We find the idea of meekness all throughout God's word. We find it in all the great individuals that we can study in the Bible. Leads me to number two, the test of Jesus Christ's character and person. What again, what is what is meekness? And a word I would just simply say, meekness is Christ's likeness, becoming more and more and more like Christ. How do we attain to it? Well, our scripture reading in Matthew 11 helps us to discover that, that answer. Once again, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, take my yoke upon me and learn of me. Once again, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. How do we become meek? We become meek by becoming submissive to Jesus Christ. Take my yoke upon you was a figure the rabbis used for going to school, but it carried with it the idea of submission 
to a teacher. The actual word used to express the idea of meekness is the word used by the Greek writer Xenophon to speak of a horse broken to the bridle. He was not speaking of some old plug, old horse without spirit, strength, or sensitivity, but a horse that was strong, sensitive, and high spirit, yet a horse that was submissive to its master. That's what Jesus is teaching us, one that has spirit, a life that has spirit within it, a life that, that is courageous, a life that is strong, yet a life that is yet still submissive to our master, Jesus himself. Meekness, catch it, is the courage to fear God rather than fearing man. It's the courage to fear God rather than fearing men. Let me continue with the thought. We become meek not only by submitting to Christ, but by learning from Christ. Learning from Christ. Let me give you five things we can learn real quickly. Number one, we can learn the unselfishness of Christ. The unselfishness. The unselfishness of the one who came, according to Matthew 20, who came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. We we don't live for ourselves, but we live for Jesus. We, We live for Jesus by doing what? Serving those that are around us, loving those that are around us. We we learn the unselfishness of Christ. Number two, we learn the gentleness of Christ. Peter said of him in 1 Peter 2, 23, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not. The gentleness. Boy, how difficult that is. Why? Because when somebody does harm to us, what do we want to do? Harm right back to them. It's not the way of Jesus. It's not the example of Jesus. Number three, we learn the humility of Christ. That we're lowly in heart means teachable, thoughtful of others, depending not on self but on God for his strength. Humility is an inseparable corollary of meekness. Number four, we are to learn the courageousness of Christ. At the bottom of the world's bravery lurks a miserable cowardice, the terrible fear that people will think that we are afraid. Yet Jesus had the courage to follow the will of the Father all the way to the cross, regardless of people or their malice. Customs are convention. Just simply, he was willing to do the will of his Father all the way throughout his life. We can learn the courageousness of Christ. Let me give you one more. We are to learn the strength of Christ, the strength of Christ. I believe Paul caught the meaning of this when he makes this statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. When I am weak, then he is strong. When I am weak, then he is strong, strong in me, strong through me. Dependence on God releases his power in and through our life. I'll say it one more time. Dependence on God releases his power in and through our life. Gets me to the third thought today, the test of results in regards to meekness. Jesus assured us that the power of meekness is vindicated by by the results. Look at it again, Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek. He says, for they shall inherit the earth. Who owns the earth is a big question. Who who owns the earth? I would say those like Jesus who are meek, who are lowly in heart and have found found rest unto their souls. May we understand the word rest in at least three ways. Let me give them to you briefly. Number one, sensation from strife. The quiet and tranquility of an inner peace. The world belongs to those. Catch it. The world belongs to those who have peace in their hearts. The world belongs to those who have peace in their heart. Number two, to rest on something as a foundation. The meek person rests their life on Jesus. 
who is that solid rock, that firm foundation of our lives. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3, for, other found, for no other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is, he says, Jesus Christ. The test, of the, the test of the results is who our foundation of life is. And lastly, number three, to rest in the sense of a legal term. The lawyer, having finished his plea for his client, turns to the court, and what does they say? We rest our case. The meek individual rest his case in the hands of Jesus. For if indeed he is meek, he has faith in the final vindication of the right and the triumph of love. The victory is not in myself. My victory is in Jesus. My hope, my joy, my peace, all that I am, let me say it, is encompassed in the person of Jesus Christ. So once again, Matthew 5, 5, Jesus makes this great declaration, the third of the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. My prayer is this for you today. God, help us to follow and to imitate the life of Jesus, who was strong, very spirited, had great courage, yet he was continuously submissive to the will of his father, completely surrendering his life to the point that we identified Jesus was willing to lay down his life so that people like you and I, people all around the world, could receive salvation. And he's asking us to do the exact same thing. To be person, a person of great life, a person of great courage, a person of a high spirits, yet a person who is, is submissive, submissive to God. Meaning what? Allowing God to direct our steps, allowing God to direct the activities, the purposes of our lives. He says, once again, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church?